Hello and welcome to Arts and Entertainment with Chris and Randall. I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And welcome to the show. Today we are talking about uh, Young Indiana Jones, the TV series which went by two different names, uh, Young Indiana Jones Chronicles and the Adventures of Young Indiana Jones. But before we get too deep, uh, as always, uh, please like, subscribe, share, comment. Randall, what's the best way to reach us? Well, uh, check out our website first, kristenrandall.com, uh, various ways to reach us, to find us online. Uh, our Facebook page is a pretty good way to reach us. We're both on Facebook. Uh, check it out. So before there was The Mandalorian, before there was a, a Marvel TV series on Disney+, Plus, before there was even a Game of Thrones, back all the way in 1992 on regular commercial-based TV, ABC, uh, there was a show produced by Paramount, produced by Amblin Entertainment, which is Steven Spielberg's production company, and Lucasfilm called The Adventures of Young Indiana Jones, or The Chronicles of Young Indiana Jones. It actually went by two different names. Uh, what had happened is it says, as, first off, I'm going to assume all of you are familiar with Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you are not familiar, with Raiders of the Lost Ark, then you might just turn us off right now. <laughs> Go rent it, watch it, have some fun, and then check back with us when you're you're. Flat. So, anyway, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark was was written and conceived of by George Lucas and co-produced by Steven Spielberg. Uh, prior to this century, there were three Raiders. There were three movies. That uh, with Harrison Ford playing Indiana Jones, there was Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, and the Temple of Doom. 1989, the third Indiana Jones films come out. It's called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It's kind of an interesting film. You've seen it, Randall, right? Yep. It introduces us to Indiana Jones' dad, right? Played by Sean Connery. Yep, Sean Connery. Dr. Jones, as he's referred to in that. <laughs> And you, you probably saw the uh, the opening sequence uh, featuring River Phoenix as the right. young Indiana Jones. Right. So I, what had happened was while they were working on this film, Sean Connery and Harrison Ford, actors as they are, kept on wanting to know the backstory of their relationship. So they kept on asking Lucas. So Lucas started to think about what was Indy like as a boy. And then he writes that opening sequence, which is, stars a little late Rivers Phoenix. And after the film is over, Lucas really starts to think about the fact that because Indiana Jones, whose real name is Henry. What is Indiana Jones's real name? Yeah, it's Henry, isn't it? Yeah, it's Henry. So, right, Indiana was the name of his dog. Right. That's a trivia question. So anyway, <laughs> uh, Lucas realizes, well, he would have been born in 1899. So he would live through a lot of great history in the early 20th century. So he thought, how amazing would it be to chronicle, say, ages five or six, ages six to whatever age he is when we meet him in, uh, funny to say this, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right? Because I think that's 1938. Yeah, on the movie timeline, I think Temple of Doom is supposed to be the first one. It happens before World War uh, II. Yeah, so that's uh, Indiana Jones in his mid-30s. So uh, apparently Lucas wrote, get this, 70 stories. <laughs> well, we don't know how extensive he went into these he, stories. but I don't yeah. know how extensive he went, but he would write down like the, the months. This is Lucas for you, right? He writes the year and the month. Well, see, this shows where, where in the world <clears throat> Indy is and what famous people on that in that month does he encounter? In that right. Circumstance. Right. Well, I just want to say about uh, Lucas, you know, this is really Lucas's strength, you know, is uh, world building, you know, yeah. and, you know, that's what really is apparent in the first Star Wars. And uh, and that's really apparent in uh, even this show. You know, he's he's building this world for Indiana Jones, uh, just like you described. I mean, it. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, it's so ambitious. And, and, and that's the thing about we, we talked about during Mandalorian that 
you know, Lucas is, he has the ambition of a filmmaker. And when we talk about Mandalorian, it was really the first thing, sorry, not Mandalorian. Uh, when we were talking about uh, Boba Fett, my apologies, folks. Oh when yeah, we Boba Fett, Boba the Fett, Genesis. That was like uh, a couple episodes back. We we're talking right, about so, uh, where did Boba Fett come from? Like from so uh, the Star um, Wars Christmas special is really uh, Lucas's first foray into t- television, and The Mandalorian is definitely the latest Lucas film, uh, but into t- in journey into TV. But the problem is. Uh, Lucas is no longer in charge of this of his Star Wars stuff. So if you really want to catch Lucas really in his prime working with TV, this is a show to watch. So why I picked on this show and I said, hey, Randall, I really want to do this is we're now living in an era where TV shows on like Disney Plus, on HBO, on Netflix are much more cinematic. You know, you watch Game of Thrones. You're, you know, that's all over the world. You watch Mandalorian and it's taking a pre-existing cinematic universe and putting it in a TV universe and exploring all sorts of interesting elements in a way that feels still more like the Star Wars series. Even the Marvel TV shows somehow feel like they're more connected to the movies and less like the Marvel TV shows of the past. Now, I'm not going to say that... Uh, the Indiana Jones, Young Indiana Jones is the first cinematic style TV shows. I mean, you start seeing in the 80s, Amblin Entertainment, that Steven Spielberg's production company in the mid 80s, did a an anthology series called Amazing Stories. Did you ever see that, Randall? Yeah, so I loved Amazing Stories as a kid. Uh, it was a great show. Yeah. And they would get people like, you know, Joe Dante, Joe, Joe Johnston, people from the Spielberg universe to direct episodes. And in some senses they were uh, cinematic, but they were still filmed here in LA on sound stages. They would run about 20 minutes, except for two episodes, which ran 50 minutes. And they were anthology. So once the episode was done, even if there would be no continuation, no continuing characters, but they did use some pretty good movie directors. They did use some good actors and they told some, as they said, pretty fantastical stories. Then you have a show like Miami Vice where Michael Mann used camera techniques and sequences that up until that point really would be more used in film and not on a TV show, like a five minute sequence of a guy driving a car where the camera is placed by the tire and you hear of all in the air tonight. That's a very, that's using the language of cinema, right? Would you say, Randall, you've seen Miami Vice. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, so I'm thinking a lot of things as you're talking. I mean, uh, you're using the word cinematic, and uh, I I think what you're keying in on is um, the fact that they're getting the camera out onto locations, and they're spending a lot of time composing shots, so it's, uh, and we've talked about this in other shows, especially our art direction show, um, they're spending a lot of time composing shots that are more uh, akin to photography rather than the theater. Yes. Um, and so like what you're talking about shooting a tire. <laughs> so, yeah. so if you're doing, if you're doing theater, you're probably not going to spend a lot of time with showing a tire on the stage. I don't think. <laughs> well, but like, yeah, there's a famous sequence in Miami Vice in the pilot where, uh, Sonny Crockett's in his Porsche, just driving through Miami at night and listening to in the air tonight by Phil Collins and the camera's POV is sometimes from the tire. Sometimes it's a long shot, sometimes it's a close up, but it kind of goes back and forth with no dialogue, almost no dialogue, just showing him from various angles driving through the night, just trying to make sense of whatever it is that he's trying to make sense of. It's a beautiful thing, but if you watch television back in the 80s, it made no sense. Right, so I would argue that what you're keying into here is uh that's the language of photography. That's a series of, uh, of uh, photographs is what you're looking at. It's like a slideshow. And it's not the language of uh, theater anymore. So the language of theater is uh, there's always dialogue, right, Chris? I mean, when you there's write a play. There's always dialogue. And, and when, you write right. a pl- when you write a play, there's, uh, you write a script, and the script, it consists mostly of dialogue, right? 
And that's why when you look at television, the sound stage, much like a theater stage, is very important. Most one hour TV shows on network back in the 80s and 90s really just took place on a sound stage. You know, so you had sets, you you didn't have a lot of location work. If there was location work, it was a permanent uh, location like MASH used like a, or Bonanza. They had their particular outdoor sets that they would constantly use, but there wasn't a lot uh, that didn't happen within and everything was lit in what they call high key. And every scene propelled it forward. So in 1992, ABC is owned by Disney Television. They produce uh, Young Indiana Jones. And it, it's a strange and very ambitious, it's pitched on one hand as educational, it's riding off the crest of the popularity of Indiana Jones movies. It's it's a strange year for TV because in the early 90s, shows like Miami Vice and China Beach, which I forgot to mention, another cinematic show with a lot, dealt a lot with Vietnam War, and it had a lot to, of cinematic techniques. 30-something is another one that used a lot of cinematic techniques. So this is pushing the envelope. This is bold. This is ambitious. At the same time, Steven Spielberg has pitched a thing called The Class of 65, which is about the Civil War and the generals who went to West Point who fought on the Confederacy versus those who fought for the Union. That one was incredibly short-lived, but ABC committed to doing two seasons. They shot it over 35 countries. Each episode had a budget of $1.5 million, which today is about $3 million, which even by today's standards wouldn't make it as expensive as, say, Game of Thrones, but it's probably what I would say the budget is for Mandalorian or Loki, wouldn't you say? $3 million an episode? Yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah, that sounds pretty high for, for TV. Um... And they had a three-week shooting <laughs> period for each episode. Can you believe that? Yeah, and see, they gave it to him because uh, this is the guy that made Star Wars. You know, I mean, yeah. they're going <laughs> to give and, and, him whatever and he wants. Spielberg signed his name on it, too. So this is the guy who made E.T. Right. You know, this is the guy who is making Jurassic Park. So, like, you know, you've got two of the biggest men at the height of their power. So a blank check has been written. And, and I also want to say this is like we're coming out of the 70s, which is the era of the auteur, right, if, if you're a yeah. film student. And... And so Lucas and Spielberg are the most bankable auteurs of the 70s. <laughs> so. And 80s. And 80s. And, and 80s. And so, well, today so, maybe so, even. But so it's just, yeah, actually even today. But but it's so, for the younger listeners, you know, this was a game changer. And I honestly think it probably came out a little too early because uh, it was canceled after two seasons for the very reason it was a very expensive show that never made its money back. Uh so right now, it's available to stream on the Paramount Network. I think that's what Paramount Plus, which is the old uh, CBS online. Uh, you can also buy them on DVD. Uh, they are, uh, we, we, you can watch them on YouTube. Maybe we'll give the, the audience a yeah, link. Yeah, we'll to link to, we, we watched. Watch. We watched two specific episodes of uh, Young Indiana Jones for this show, and we'll link to them. So if you if you want to do it the the pirate way, um, <laughs> I'm not advocating you do it. I'm just saying it's it's certainly there for you to do. Well, uh, listen, will... you can watch them and then mail George Lucas a check after you watch yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. And Steven Spielberg, <laughs> absolutely right. Uh, I will point out that in 2000, the episodes were remastered. So if you do get the DVD, or if you watch it on Paramount Plus, the sound and picture quality. And I just, I did watch a remastered version on YouTube. You could watch a remastered. Okay, my point is, if you get the remastered, is is beautiful. It really does make a difference. So, well, I'll just say, I'll just say that uh, they've over the years they've taken the original show and like altered it and changed it. They've smushed two episodes together to make. Uh, one long episode. Well, so in instead of there's cases. 29 individual episodes or 22 90 minute movies, which we'll get to. So let's first explain the show. So the show takes place in two parts. Uh, there is Indiana Jones 
from the age of six to nine. So those stories take place between 1906 and 1910. And they featured an actor named Corey Comer, who uh, plays young Indiana Jones, who, you know, he's living at home with his parents. His father is a professor of archeology span at Princeton. And then there is the teen Indy of ages 16 to 21, played by Sean Patrick Flannery. Uh, and those episodes take place mostly, there's one episode or two episodes in America, but most of those episodes take place during World War I. There are other episodes that don't involve World War I, but unlike the younger indie bo- episodes, World War I is a significant chunk, wouldn't you say, of the storylines? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't watched them in a long time, Chris, but yeah, I mean, he Lucas seems to be setting a lot of these uh, stories in Europe. A couple of them happen in the United States, but... Uh, or, or There's in the- Africa, Asia. They do go all over the world. They filmed it in 35 countries. Now, for those of you with children, uh, let's get to it right now. Uh, what is the appropriate age group? So... These are educational. If you get the DVDs, there are 94 featurettes, which you can watch and timelines to give you more information. It covers people as well known as George Gershon to as obscure as, uh, well, not obscure, but the ballet dancer Diaghilev, uh, Krishnamurta, uh, the Red Baron, Patton, uh, Louis Armstrong. I mean, it, it's an eclectic mix, wouldn't you say? What, of historical figures? Sure, yes. sure. And um, they really interact with Indy, so there really is stuff. So I would say, before we get too far into this, I would say that uh, children between the ages of 8 and 10, probably that would be appropriate for them to watch the smaller indie stuff when he is you know between the ages of seven and and ten himself and then i would say children between the ages of what would you say 12 and 14 10 and 14 for the older yeah maybe i mean you know the war stuff the war stuff in this show is like it it's it's i feel like it's it's a throwback you know it it feels like old gung-ho kind of war movies where everybody goes to war and has a good time and they they are depicting some deaths but um, well that's what i'm saying there are i would say the world war one i think that the teen episodes that don't involve world war one yeah under 12 is probably fine but i would say anything that involves world war one keep in mind that teen Teen Indy definitely is a sexually active person and a, <laughs> and a drinker. So I just, I don't want to get people to, so depending on how liberal or conservative your house is, I would say this, watch it first on your own, because as an adult, you will enjoy it, and then decide. Uh, well, can I just say something quick, Chris, about it. the educational yeah. content and the appropriateness for yeah. kids? Um, I, I think these shows are better for adults, and uh, I don't know, you know, this these shows are made in an era where there was like an obsession with making things that were educational, you know? And I, cause I remember this well from my childhood, Chris, cause I graduated high school in 93 when these came out and uh, you know, just everything, parents wanted to buy stuff that was educational all the time, you know, TV shows, they wanted them to be educational, but you know, I don't know, I don't really know how educational this show is. Well, but. no, I, I strongly disagree with you. This film, this TV series was made to introduce children and uh, there's a George Lucas clip, I'll be more than happy to place it later, to introduce children to historical events and historical people in their setting to spark curiosity. And I I strongly would disagree with you, Randall, on this. I do feel that if you have a child who is between the ages of eight and 14, depending on whether you're watching the single digit itty or the Sean Patrick Flannery indie, yeah, I definitely think it will spark interest and the DVDs thankfully come with featurettes for further learning. Uh, how well it handles history is a different question, wouldn't you say, Randall? I mean, they do take liberties on some things. Well, of course, it's a, it's like a Forrest Gump esque journey through history, you know, where Indy is there at every pivotal moment. Um, 
I mean, I can see how a kid could watch these and it would, and the kid would uh, have some questions that if you could answer, it would be great. But if you don't have the answers, then it might be it might be uh, uh, painful. <laughs> I'll say this much, you know, uh, I grew up in New York City, modern, progressive family. If I had watched this when I was ten, my mom would have been cool with it. Oh well, because, my mother was cool with me watching anything. I mean, I'm not yeah, saying. Yeah, so I, I'm not. So if I'm not saying there's any content that like yeah. kids would be harmed by, but yeah, I just I'm yeah. just wondering like just how much a kid would get out of this stuff. Uh, I think it just depends. I think the history parts, because they're dramatized and presented in an interesting way. You know, Indy actually he gets involved in a romantic love triangle that involves Hemingway. <laughs> uh, we'll get into some episodes in a moment, but I, I, I really want to say that what makes this interesting to me is there's, uh, there's two ways of viewing the show when you find it. You can watch them as they were aired on ABC TV, which were these you know 40 to 55 minute ep standalone episodes. But also one of the things they did on purpose when they filmed them was they knew that they could re-release them as short films. So they would take two episodes and make them into a 90 minute film. And they would add extra scenes and remove certain framing devices. I've seen both the uh, 90 minute features and the single standalone episodes. Uh, I don't wanna put you at a disadvantage because I didn't ask you to watch the 90 minute episodes, but I will say the 90 minute episodes are very entertaining you do feel a little bit of the episodic structure when you put two episodes together, but they were very smart in the way that they did it so that you do feel like the arc of the character's journey works from those two episodes. But watching a single episode, which is really where I think we'll focus today, my question to you is, Randall, do you feel like the show, the episodes we watch, we'll get into them in a minute, um, do you feel like they are more like a TV show or more like a short film? <laughs> well, uh, this show has a definite episodic anthology quality to it. So, yeah, they're more like short films, obviously. Uh, uh, it's not like a serial where you're continuing a story from episode to episode. Am I correct about that, Chris? Because I haven't really yeah, seen all the episodes. I would say that not really. It, I think that when you're dealing with the, the boy Indy, the episodes might reference past episodes they might even reference things that will happen in the raiders series but the really where you do find stronger continuity is once uh in indy joins the uh the belgian foreign legion in 1916 there is about three years where he is in the art he's fighting world war one and those episodes definitely connect so that as soon as one you you they're all linked together you can literally sit through every single one of those episodes from start to finish and it becomes how world war one changes indiana jones so that said uh i'm gonna stick up the next question and just talk about the two episodes we saw so the first episode we saw dealt with the corey comer the young indiana jones uh it takes place in vienna uh what is the date on that? Do you have the date on that one? Uh, 1908, Vienna. 1908, Vienna. So this is a nine-year-old Indiana Jones with his father and mother in Vienna, Austria. And uh, it's during the reign of the Habsburgs. And in this episode, uh, young Henry uh, meets and gets a crush on Princess Sophia, the prince, the he was it was about roughly the same age, or maybe just slightly older than him, and uh, complications ensue. Randall, what did uh, please add a little more to this story? Well, I mean, I feel like it's a it's a, a throwback to classic Hollywood romances where you have uh, uh, two people who fall in love at the very beginning, and then you know because of circumstances they have to be kept apart, and then. Indy goes on this grand adventure to try to reconnect with his love. I mean, he's only eight, but it's <laughs> so it's done like sweetly. It's done like um, I don't know. There's this there's this thing that happens in in the era, right, Chris? Where uh, I was telling you about this before the show. There, there's like this uh, this this trend from that era 
I'd say like the 60s through the 70s where or in the 80s now and 90s I guess where like you, this is kind of the last of it where you where you depict sort of like a precocious uh, love uh, affair with little kids like yeah uh, I mean you see that in the 70s and in the 80s there's a lovely movie with Diane Lane called uh, what was it called romance is that what it was called i, I don't know it up. The, the last there, movie the last big there's movie definitely I, movies like that yeah yeah the last big movie i could think of that 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 was a hit that depicted that was uh i think it was called my girl with anna chomsky she was like yeah she was like 10 that, or something yeah. um it's just uh, the you know the height was like brooke shields you know and like blue lagoon and uh, well, pretty blue baby lagoon that is sort sex, of thing. and pretty baby is about uh prostitution so that's not i would I kind of steer you away on those two, but there were in the seventies and eighties these lovely movies about early childhood love, and uh, you're you're definitely on something when you're talking about My Girl. Uh, I'm looking for the movie that had a very young child, Diane Lane, because it's such a good movie. It was called. Uh, and an- another feature of like this of this sort of uh, type of um, of uh, entertainment was uh, this would usually be the kid's first love, and the yeah. kid would wonder a loss of innocence. The kid, yeah, and the kid would wonder what love was, you know, because they're having these weird feelings, and <laughs> so they're asking the adults around them. So that's what goes on in this episode. Uh, and it, it, it's it's interesting. I I did cut out the framing device a little romance 1979 thank you uh so back when the show was originally on and that they uh had a framing device where you see indiana jones in the modern era played by george c hall he's 93 years old and in this particular episode his children have forced him to see a therapist and he's telling the therapist about how he first met sigmund freud so uh I would say that this episode to me is less about uh, Indiana Jones being in love with Princess Sophia. And it's actually very, I'm more than going to give away the ending, but I say, <laughs> you know, in, in the modern era, when they flash forward, they like, well, you know, whatever happened to you and Princess Sophia? Now, we obviously know that Indiana Jones doesn't marry Princess Sophie, but he said, well, you know, it was a kid, you know, these things don't last. He just wipes it off because, you know, with brutal honesty, uh, first loves never did. And uh, and I love that kind of very grown up kind of brusqueness. It, they cut out all the George C. Halls because I think at some point they didn't want to tip the scales of what would be the future of Indiana Jones. They wanted to keep that loose. In fact, here's a little interesting thing. Uh, Harrison Ford will be the same age as the actor who played 93-year-old Indy when the next Indiana Jones movie comes out, which is supposed to be a year from this Friday, by the way. So this is a very timely episode. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about is that, to me, this episode, and a lot of, uh, one of the overriding things that they explore in both iterations of teen Indy and child Indy is Indy's coming to terms with the meaning of love, you know? Throughout all these episodes, when he does fall in love, it's it 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 never works out, and his understanding is constantly being struggled for. So for me, what and this is one of the last episodes they would do with uh, Corey Comer was uh, really delve. I would argue less. I would argue what you're saying into the traditional tropey childhood crush story, and more. What is the nature of love? Because In this episode, Indy's mother talks about the nature of love. Indy's father talks about the nature of love. Indy's governess says sometimes love comes too early and sometimes it comes too late, which you hear other people say throughout the Indiana Jones TV series, kind of a creepy thing. And then you have this wonderful scene where Max von Sydow plays Sigmund Freud and he is having a debate as he is trying to inform young Indy about the nature of love. But in that same room is Alfred Adler and Carl Jung, all three men who knew each other, worked each other in that time, all arguing in front of the boy, what is the appropriate understanding? And then uh, 
Side it's, a, it's a fairly adult conversation, and well, it's good conversation. Yeah. Uh, Freud is I, saying to him is that you know behind all romantic love is sexual desire. <laughs> Nine year old boy who's drinking schnapps. So <laughs> I do yeah. want to warn you guys. You know George Lucas's understanding of what is appropriate for children is a Marin Valley, California understanding of what's appropriate yeah well you know yeah it, that was that was great about this episode don't write that letter you know? yeah i just want to say like that's straight out of the 70s i feel like that 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 scene like yeah george if george lucas hadn't have been from where he was from and the 70s hadn't happened you couldn't have that episode you know that was like that was pure that was pure 70s where we accepted that kind of uh nature of childhood which now, while anymore. Lucas <laughs> wrote that episode, it was actually directed by a wonderful director named Billy August, who is a Norwegian filmmaker who only a few years prior to this, in 1987, won the Palme d'Or at Cannes and the Golden Globe for Best uh, Foreign Film. And the film was called Pele the Conqueror. It was about Norwegian immigrant farmers, a father and his little son. And the father was played by Max von Sydow. And it was about the little boy Pele, who has to deal with all of their hardships. So Billy August is a uniquely talented director to do this episode, both in working with children and also working with Von Sydow. And it's, and you see this a lot in episodes of Young Indiana Jones, where they they will take well-known actors to play famous people or non-famous people, and other times you will see up-and-coming actors would later on have a great career. So let's look at the teen Indiana Jones in an episode titled Palestine, October 1917. Want to give us the backstory on that one? Or? All right, sure. You know, um, uh, this there's actually a lot of espionage in this episode, and it's it's pretty, it's done really well. I thought um, Indiana Jones is a, literally a, playing a spy. He's a spy for uh, what the Belgian army. He is a spy. Well, the Belgian army working for the French army. Yeah, so because Belgium yeah, it, and France. Right, so he's a spy he's for actually, them. Uh, yeah. And he is, uh, and there's a lot of twists and turns. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of reveals. And um, I, I thought. Crosses and double, double crosses. Double crosses and double crosses. I thought for a spy, uh, for a spy uh, story, it was really, really well done. Like one of the best. And it's so interesting because. Whereas the one that we just reviewed with Sigmund Freud is a very, it's very low on plot. It really is a lot about famous people like the uh, Archduke uh, Franz, Franz Ferdinand talking about his love for his wife and how that affected his kingdom. And it's a lot about people who are early 20th century or late 19th century individuals talking about how hard it was in that period in time to see the difference between duty and romance and love. This one, on the other hand, is a super plot intensive. Like you gotta pay close attention because there's such- Yeah, it, 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 it'll it it'll move uh, in front of the audience for the most part. I mean, you're, you'll be playing catch up the whole time you're watching it. Uh, and I just wanna say too, like all these episodes, I think Lucas definitely wanted like a, a large, uh, a large amount of action in all of them. I mean, even in the uh, the last episode with eight year old Indy, he's um, he's running around this castle. Oh yeah, the action palace. sequences are amazing. Yeah, he's running around this palace. So you know, and I think they shot in an actual uh, European palace, and I mean, it's beautiful. You know, the set is beautiful. Uh, oh yeah, the the Vienna stuff I know was filmed in Vienna. I don't know where they shot the palace. That looked like a real palace to me. Well, if so anybody, it might have been Israel. Or it might have been somewhere in Africa, but they did go all over the world to get, you know, as anything as authentic as they could. Yeah, well, this this uh, so Lawrence of Arabia is in this episode um, in the uh, this World War One episode, and uh, and there's there's a there's war, there's a, there's a, a big military town. battle, there's a femme fatale, there's, there's a big mil- yeah, Catherine Zeta Jones, a Zeta young Jones belly dances about a twenty four year old Catherine Zeta Jones is a belly dancer. <laughs> There is a, an evil, I will say, it, for the most part, the uh, portrayal of the Germans in World War I is pretty even-headed most of the time, and most of the people who are bad guys, if there isn't even a bad guy, some episodes have no bad guys, but in this particular one, there is a German captain who is just hardcore bad guy, 
and he is played by Daniel Craig of the James Bond <laughs> series to, to perfection. There is a fight scene in this. There's several, but he, it's just, it's great. Would yeah, you, you know, yeah. There's a huge fight scene. There's like a there's a war. You know, there's a, there's a, there's this uh, giant war scene. Uh, there's, and then on top of all this stuff, you know, the espionage and everything. There's uh there's office politics going on with uh, Daniel Craig's character and <laughs> and, and, oh, and the garrison. Turks. Yeah, and the Turks. And it's and even that's done well. I mean, the writing oh. is amazing. I mean, so who was it? Darabont, Frank Darabont. Frank wrote Darabont. So that episode was written by Frank Darabont. And it's interesting when you think about Frank Darabont because he's most known for writing the Shawshank Re Redemption, which is an adaptation of a short story by Stephen King. He just won a two hundred million dollar lawsuit right. against AMC because he did the pilot in the first season of Walking Dead, which is an adaptation of Robert Kirkman. Uh, and I, I, I think the gift of Darabont is he figures out what someone with who's very iconic a writer like King or Kirkman or Lucas, what makes them them? And then he cops that style and does like a brilliant, so I would argue this is one of the most George Lucas episodes not to be written by George Lucas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's another thing about this is, um, is uh, Lucas, we already discussed, Lucas uh, is obsessed with world building. And this episode just moves at a breakneck pace through this, what to us modern people would seem like a, a completely different universe. And it just moves, you know, at a at a fast clip through it, and you can barely understand anything that's going on. But it's it's like uh, Darabont, the direct. Everybody's already d decided, you know, uh, what everything means, and they're not gonna fill you in on everything. It's 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 very THX eleven thirty eight ish, I think. You know, it's, I'd also say it it feels even more like the Mandalorian, you know, <laughs> because the Mandalorian also has a lot of desert sequences. There is a, a, a could have. There's a thing with Bedwit where they're fighting a, a a tribe at the beginning. There's a shootout scene on horses, horseback, which is just brilliant, right? Where they're yes, where they're being attacked, and it made me realize, you know, a lot of what you see, you know, again, Lucas didn't write. Again, Dave is it Dave Filoni and Filoni? John Favreau. Mm -hmm. They also understand how to do Lucas without being Lucas. Uh, they. Uh, you can really see a lot of Mandalorian style, you know, especially because the Mandalorian on one hand, season one, he comes into town, he takes on an adventure and something happens in that episode that sets him on the road for the next adventure. And that's a lot of the teen Indiana Jones storylines is that he, he does something, he comes into town metaphorically, he does his bit and whatever happens at the end sends him on to his next adventure. Well, so what what do you think, Chris, makes uh, makes this so George Lucasy, this uh, young Indiana Jones, especially well, this uh, World War One stuff? As you said, world building, his love of ideas, his love of concepts. You know, almost every episode, even the one we just described, isn't just the action, but it really is about you know, it's pretty even handed on the way they portray the characters in it so that you think about the fact that you have a Palestinian working for the Axis because it's not her war. You have the Turks who are in an alliance with the Germans, but you can see there's not a lot of respect. You, you know, many times there's little, you know, I actually think in many ways, I think Indiana Jones is better than Star Wars because I feel like Indiana Jones is George Lucas's interpretation of a known universe, whereas Star Wars, he's too much like God. And that's actually a great question that leads right up into, uh, let's just take a moment to look at the difference between Young Indy and the Solo movie. You saw the Solo movie, right? Mm, yes. Are you a humongous fan of the Solo movie? No, I'm not. <laughs> I didn't enjoy the Solo movie. I thought I thought it was mostly very boring, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Uh... I mean, even if I was being polite and say the action sequences in the solo movie are pretty cool, or it was nice to see Donald Glover play Lando Calrissian, you know, it's a it's worthy of comparison because these are two iconic characters created with George Lucas and to a certain degree by the choices made by Harrison Ford, and you're seeing both of them in their formative prequel 
years. And I have to ask you, why do you think that, I have an idea why, but why do you think uh, Young Indiana Jones works and Solo doesn't as a prequel, as informing us about this character? Yeah, you know, I think that, uh, I think the Solo movie suffers from something similar that almost all the non-Lucas Star Wars movies suffer from, and that is, they feel the need to be Star Warsy. They feel the need to contribute to the characters. They feel the need to uh, to uh, contribute to some kind of backstory of the universe. And uh, the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, obviously, uh, I don't think they care about that. <laughs> They're just trying to make yeah, something I mean, fun and interesting, you know? And that that's what Lucas did with the prequels, you know? And a lot of people didn't like the prequels because they're so different than the original trilogy. But, I mean, but Lucas wasn't afraid to expand the universe and add to it, you know? And, and, and I think that's the problem with these, uh, these the new Star Wars stuff, some of it. Well, it's interesting, you know, some of the stuff they learned from the special effects, uh, which I want to get into next, uh, in the young Indiana Jones, they, Rick McCollum, who was the producer, associate producer of young Indiana Jones, is also the associate producer of the sequels that came out or the prequels that came out in the Star Wars. And they said a lot of what they applied in Star Wars, those prequels, is what they learned from working on Young Indiana Jones. So this is an interesting thing. Let's let's get a little bit more into the weeds for those of us who really are into cinema. (laughs) To save money, they shot the the, the original series in 16 millimeter film. Uh, At the time, movies and some TV shows were shot in 35, but not everything was shot in film. So can you explain to us the significance of that? Um, I guess I would say, I mean, obviously they're just doing it to save money, but I can also see uh, like an aesthetic reason they might want to do that because the 60 millimeter cameras would be uh, smaller, lighter. Um, They could probably move them easier. Um, they could probably use more of them. They could probably roll multiple cameras at once. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of aesthetic reasons I could see that they would just go to 16. I mean, the you know, after watching the action sequences, the action sequences in um, <laughs> in the 1917 uh, uh, episode were, were were impressive, Chris. I mean, there's a <laughs> there's a long drawn out fist fight at the end. I, I don't want to give it too much away, but there's a long drawn out fist fight between Indy and another character at the end, and. I mean, it, it re, it's it's so long. It reminds me of the one in um, the John Carpenter movie. What is it? They Live, which I love, by oh, yeah. the way. Um, but yeah, it was great. It was great. Well, like there is a sequence it's, where uh, one of the things you learn about is the Australians. And that's cool, too. You learn about how the Australians fought the difference between the mounted infantry versus the British cavalry. And uh, there's a sequence where the mounted infantry is charging the Turks and some of what they're doing is they're incorporating footage from the film A Light Horseman and some of it they're just using horses themselves and period cannons and they're cutting back and forth between the horses the cannons there's a lot of quick cutting uh that sequence the charging sequence you know you really hold your breath yeah, I mean, the war footage, uh, the war stuff in this episode is really good, really well done. You know, I was thinking, too, maybe they used 16 so they could, because you were telling me before they were incorporating a lot of uh, footage from other sources. I mean, using 16, that would hide better. I mean, yeah. if they're shooting everything in 35 um, and they're bringing in sources like even old newsreel footage, it's not going to look that, old newsreels are like 16 for the most part. I mean, it's not going to look that good when they bring There's it in. There's a horse rage on the beach. And you know that one was just shot. You know, like that's nobody's footage. They're just, it's a beautiful beach. It's not Malibu. You remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Let me say another thing. You know, both, it's funny because both episodes, the the young indie one from 1908 and this one, 1917 one, they're, uh, they both have a lot of horseback stuff. I mean, it's, yeah. it's well, like. He's a champion horseback. Right. You know, that's right. Indie is. Yeah. And it's like Lucas is, uh, Lucas is is nearly aware. I mean, I guess he is aware. He's making a western. He's making he's making like modern westerns. Uh, you could almost argue. Um, Absolutely. I mean, there's episodes with the train. I mean, he's using a lot of the. And there's a John Ford episode featuring John Ford. 
I'm gonna have to watch that, Chris, because like I oh, saw that John Ford did an episode. A, the, the Hollywood one and the Birth of the Blues are probably the two best. I didn't want to go over the two best because I wanted I wanted to save stuff for those of you who were, who were gonna watch this. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying is that most TV in the '90s you don't have a lot of exterior scenes because it's very expensive to film an exterior scene, right, Randall? You got to deal with lighting, time issues rigging issues it's not easy right yeah i mean well yeah all location shooting is going to be more expensive and more difficult you know i think another another reason is uh uh you lose some control when if you're the producer of, of something you lose some control if uh if you're giving it to the director like if you if you if you tell the director oh yeah you could travel halfway around the world and shoot some stuff and then come back and cut it together, then you've lost a lot of control because uh, they're going to have trouble with the script. They're not going to be able to shoot the script exactly, so they're going to have to make up a bunch of stuff. So uh, you can see, like, so that's why stuff, I think that's one of the main reasons stuff gets shot on sound stages because yeah. the producer can stick around and make sure everything's done exactly like the script, you know, and, <laughs> and if it's not, they can redo it. But they gave We're Lucas right. a lot of freedom. They gave Lucas a lot of freedom. Lucas gave his uh, the people he picked a lot of freedom. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, who shot this one? The Darabont episode. Do you know? Uh, I Simon Windsor, who okay. did a lot of episodes and was also a big director. Yeah, yeah. Three weeks is a you know, the average TV show. One hour TV show. It's anywhere from maybe you know seven, five to ten days uh, to do the whole show. So that you should have 21 days to shoot a 50 minute episode that's insane yeah i mean you the 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 fight in this one at the end is just it's crazy uh but yeah i mean I, they're giving him lucas is giving him that much time i think because he wants them to come up with something you know he wants them to go out there and get the gold you know cuz he's a, he's lucas is a director and so it's he interesting wants, to think, go ahead sorry yeah lucas is the director so he 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 understands what they're trying to do he understands uh the process and he wants i don't even know if he was on the set on these but um i'm sure he trusted them and it's interesting because clearly when you're watching the the shorter episodes they were written for commercial breaks but when you're watching them you're not going to watch it with commercial breaks and you will have a harder time feeling the commercial break coming because normally in, in tv that has commercials, everything leads up to that pivotal moment. Then we cut away from the commercial. There's a serialized nature of Indiana Jones movies. So there is an ability to come up with that, but there are a lot of, and again, the Freud episode is a better example of this, or where things are just moving at a slower non TV pace, a movie pace where characters are just having fun, going for a horse race, just joking <laughs> around just having a conversation, just eating a meal. There's a sense of languor, which you now see in TV shows on HBO Max, for example, or Disney Plus, but you wouldn't see on a show where there's commercials. But I will say when you were watching the 90 minute movies on the DVD, where they added scenes, they smoothed transitions, they got rid of old man indie, it's <laughs> even better. So it is interesting to realize that the source material was written Theoretically, I think also because it was owned by ABC uh, at the time, Disney owned ABC. It was actually owned by Paramount, but it must have been in the contract that they didn't have to worry about when commercial breaks were because it doesn't have the rhythm and the patterns. Well, you know, it's that funny. Other I, one hour shows have. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, uh, I remember an interview uh, I read with David Lynch, and he said he was. Uh, he and Frost, you know, the writer, the co-writers of Twin Peaks, they were making Twin Peaks uh, at the exact same time. This, yes. this is actually going on on ABC, I'd like to point out. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, Twin Peaks has a lot of the same qualities as this show. You know, Twin Peaks is another uh, uh, struggled in the ratings, but, you know, it's fondly remembered, very influential. Um, but, but Twin Peaks did fully felt like television. Well, Lynch, Lynch said that he was definitely uh, trying to bring people into and out of the commercial breaks in each episode yeah and um you know there's actually a fan edit of twin peaks that's about three and a half hours long where it oh, cuts wow. out it cuts out all the extraneous stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the uh the the murder of laura palmer 
<laughs> and it's really good. You'd have to like pirate it, but it's really good. Um, that's so, an aside, Chris. But uh, but uh, yeah, I think you might be right about this Indiana Jones thing. I mean, I Lucas just didn't care about the commercials. You know, he's just he's just delivering like it, on time. I was gonna say, even when you look at the YouTube, you'll realize that most episodes are longer than forty-two minutes. Which forty-two minutes in nineteen ninety-two is the runtime for a commercial one-hour show. You had, you know, anywhere from forty-two to forty-eight. Uh, forty-eight minutes. I'm sorry. So you'd have had forty-eight minutes, but some episodes are longer than forty-eight because of the European cuts, and the European cuts go longer. This is really nerdy stuff. But the key <laughs> thing is this: uh, I honestly think the last Indiana Jones movie, the, the Crystal Skull, which weirdly enough was supposed to be one of the unaired episodes originally came out as an idea for young Indy when George Lucas was getting into those uh, actual skulls they found. But I honestly think in some ways that the Indiana Jones TV series is better than that movie in particular because Indiana Jones as a grown man is a Superman with flaws. Whereas young Indy is a young person with all of the learning curve that a young person is going to need to get through life but with great virtues and skills his great virtues and skills but he's still not wise in the way of the world he doesn't understand himself he doesn't understand people so it's kind of neat to see the arc of who he is when he starts out which is so far from who will become but yet and this is what was missing in solo because in solo we really don't see the psychology of Solo, where it's just a real psychology and a real development where you could go, oh yeah, I can see why he never found love until his 50s. Oh, I can see like why he became cynical, you know, because so many of the episodes end so bittersweetly. You know? Well, yeah. It means I, I... well, but especially in the episode that we saw with the double crosses, he's really a pawn for someone else. Mm -hmm. So how, how well do you think the show's held up over, uh, till today uh i was surprised uh watching it i'm the same age as sean patrick flannery so when it came on the air i was in my 20s i've grown up watching it since i was a teenager and i liked it but i didn't like i, I did get i always liked the freud episode i knew about freud in college <laughs> and adler and young but that was always an episode i always thought was pretty awesome but what i'm really surprised by now as a grown-up is you know the things i missed like how the parents and the governess also are reflecting on the romantic life or if clearly i missed when i watched that i was watching Catherine zeta jones and daniel craig or how good those sequences are so for me it's it certainly held up well uh and do you feel like it has i mean i'm saying i feel it's impacted contemporary one hour tv because that was a show that would use people like mike newell who did the harry potter movies and Nicholas Rogue. I mean, they used a lot of well-known directors and writers from working cinema. And now when you watch these one hour shows, it's not uncommon to see a director, you know, from film or an actor, you know, from film. Do you feel like the legacy is there? Like it's a, it, how is influential? I mean, um, well, Darabont uh, wrote an episode. I mean, so <laughs> maybe it was influential. Uh, but you could definitely see with this show, like uh, what uh, TV wa TV creators wanted to make, right? I mean, they 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 wanted to get out of the confines of advertising-based television, and it's only till today when they've really been able to escape that. Wouldn't you say, Chris? I mean, with streaming. Absolutely. In fact, to that degree, I I know July 29th, 2022, uh, they're releasing the next installment. I want to say the final installment of Indiana Jones. It will take place in the 60s. Apparently Indy will be in the 60s. Uh, Indiana Jones, if he was alive today, would be 122, 123. Could be because he drank from that grail, right? But I, there is a rumor, and I just literally last week, which is just around the time after I pitched this episode to you, uh, apparently Disney Plus is thinking of doing a new young Indiana Jones series. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, there's 30 on, there's about 30 episodes left, 35 episodes, maybe 40 episodes left that Lucas wrote back in the nineties that have not been made. So I am hoping 
that if they do bring back young Indiana Jones, they'll pick up where they left off, which is age 21, and just take it from like ages 21 to maybe 31 and cover, you know, the 1920s and the 1930s, which will roughly put us to where we were at Temple of Doom. But it, it could happen. Uh, well, the, the shows, I can see the show's definitely fun. I mean, I, you know, over the years, you're telling me you like indie better than Star Wars. I mean, over the years, I have been like uh, wondering why there haven't been more uh, Indiana Jones movies. I mean, Indiana Jones seems like a natural for a bunch of episodic movies, doesn't it? I mean, I remember when uh, Temple of Doom came out. Yeah when I was a kid and it just seemed like a natural, like, like, yeah, great. Let's have more of these. And there haven't been that many. <laughs> so I don't know well, what's also, happening. Chris. I think that the TV series is proof. Sean Patrick Flannery was a good actor. If you like, did you ever see Boondock Saints? Yes. He was in that. Um, but other people can play Indiana Jones. It, you know what I'm saying? I think Chris Pratt could play Indiana Jones. There's always some actor out there who can, with good comedic timing and is still an action actor, would make an interesting young Indiana Jones. I don't know, someone will go, oh, maybe, you know, I don't know, someone will go in the opposite direction, but there are, there's definitely can be a new Indiana Jones. And uh, well, anyway, they, they, that, go ahead. I just wanna say, yeah, there is something enigmatic about Harrison Ford. I mean, I mean, he has somehow able to put a mark on Indiana Jones and Han Solo and, it's really tough for other actors to come in and uh, improve or <laughs> duplicate what he's done. And, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure why that might be, but, uh, you know, I mean, the stories about what Harrison Ford has contributed to the character are pretty legendary, both characters. I mean, he's definitely more than his Jack Ryan, and I've never been a big fan of anyone else who was Jack Ryan besides him and Alec Baldwin. Uh, and in fact, I promise you guys, we will do a future episode on Harrison Ford, because if there has ever been an actor who I would call America's dad, uh, <laughs> he's your dad. You know what I'm saying? He's like your really cool dad, Harrison Ford. We'll do an episode on Harrison. But until then, I'm Chris. I'm Randall. Thanks for listening or watching. Be safe, be well. Bye.